Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the uh, briefing event. I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, Audience of the Future Design Foundations competition. My name is Ben Griffin. I'm the Innovation Lead for Design at Innovate UK. So let's start by talking a bit about the context of the Design Foundations competition, what it's for and what we're hoping to achieve through this innovation funding. Now essentially R&D funding is fantastic if you've got an idea and you want to develop that idea towards commercialization. But it's important to recognize that actually the idea isn't where the innovation journey starts. We need to understand where do great ideas come from and also how can you make sure that those ideas are great and that they're worth developing before you invest in that subsequent R&D activity. And that's where we hope that the Design Foundations funding will be of use to business. <clears throat> we expect these projects to help you to identify and engage important stakeholders, to understand their needs and desires, to use that as a source of inspiration to generate lots of ideas, and then subsequently to quickly and rapidly test, learn and iterate those ideas towards an ideal solution. And finally, having been through that process, to clearly communicate those de-risked ideas ready for further R&D investment. So essentially, I'd put it like this. If you're looking at whether you're uh, suitable for R&D funding versus design foundations funding, think about your situation. Are you absolutely certain that you've got a great idea and all you need to do is work on the technical development of that idea? In that case, absolutely go for the R&D funding or even one of the demonstrator uh, opportunities. If, on the other hand, you're not certain what the ideal idea is yet, you want to spend a bit more time understanding the particular problem and the stakeholder needs and exploring different potential solutions, then a Design Foundations project is for you. Equally, if you do have an idea but you just need to validate it and spend some time engaging with stakeholders, then again, Design Foundations can be of assistance. So what do we expect a Design Foundations project to look like? Well, something like this. This is actually a generic uh, design project methodology, if you like, called the Double Diamond. And it has four clear stages, which we would expect to be fairly common across Design Foundations projects. So the first of those is the discover phase. You start with a, a generic challenge area and you discover a stakeholder insight, customer needs, explore lots of different needs and opportunities as a source of inspiration. Then move into the define stage where you begin to synthesize and distill that information and insight down towards one or more specific problem statements that you intend to address with your innovation project, a design brief if you like. You only then move into the, phase, uh, the develop phase where you're beginning to explore potential ideas and solutions uh, to, that, to that problem. Again, that's a divergent uh, thinking exercise, so you're exploring quite broadly the different opportunities available to you. And then, through a process of iterative uh, user testing, prototyping and refining, uh, synthesizing and filtering those ideas and, and early stage concepts down towards a design concept, one or more design concepts which are, if you like, ready for subsequent R&D investment. It's perhaps worth talking a little bit about the kinds of output that we would expect to each of those stages so that you can get a feel for what the uh, project structure might look like. So at the discover stage, this is really all about learning about the problem space and the market that you're addressing. You might map that stakeholder landscape visually, uh, collect qualitative insights about stakeholder motivations and behavior, perhaps via interviews or photographic or video records. And also perhaps backing that up with some quantitative insights, uh, broader understanding based on surveys, market research and so on. And perhaps uh, you would be communicating some of that insight through typical uh, customer personas or experience or journey maps that explain how stakeholders will engage with a particular uh, innovation solution. Then moving into the define stage, here we're looking for a clear definition of the problem or innovation opportunity that you're looking to address. Perhaps a design brief or an innovation strategy that explains how you intend to go about solving that problem. 
and a kind of recipe of the qualities or attributes necessary that would make a proposed solution desirable and fit for purpose. Moving then into the develop stage where you're creating ideas, we're really looking for lots of quick exploratory sketch level ideas. So not going too far along, this might just be post-it notes, scribbles, little mock-ups and models that you're making and testing, uh, and evidence that this is an iterative uh, co-creation process, if you like. So you're regularly testing these prototypes with uh, relevant stakeholders, putting your ideas in front of them, and looking for feedback and acting on that feedback. Finally, at the deliver stage, it's important to understand that we're not, here, we're not talking here about delivering your solution to market. We're actually just talking about delivering one or more concepts or propositions that's ready for further R&D investment. So that might be presented via visuals, storyboards, schematics, mock-ups, uh, and so on. Equally, it might be about creating material to support the next steps in your innovation journey. That might be about materials to support an investment pitch, a funding application, and so on. So we've talked there about a generic process, the double diamond, which is a pretty good uh, fit for most design projects. But as you'll find yourself if you Google uh, design projects, you'll find any number of variations on that theme with different colours, different uh, numbers of stages in the process. They tend to follow fairly uh, common characteristics regardless of how many steps there are or the particular terminology that they use. So let's have a look at some of those common characteristics. We expect all of these design projects to fundamentally be human-centred. And that's important because whilst technology can help you uh, deliver a, an idea and make something possible, only people can actually make that idea successful. So it's really important to understand uh, the needs and motivations of your audience and the quality of the customer experience from the outset. And we tend to find that whenever you get out there and engage with people firsthand, you'll never cease to be surprised by the way that people behave in the real world. It's never as you expect. People kind of behave in unpredictable ways and they have not only um, not only rational responses to experiences, but also emotional responses, and it's important to understand those. So you might use tools like this uh, uh, to, to document some of that process. On the left here, you can see um, a typical stakeholder map, um, the various people involved in the, the innovation process, um, videos or photographs of real-world behavior, and combining some of that insight into archetype personas. Design is also very useful in terms of reframing the problem, and this can be particularly important if you're looking for disruptive in innovation as opposed to an evolutionary step change process. So if, for example, you start a project uh, with the statement that people want a better washing machine, then you're inevitab inevitably going to be looking at uh, ways to make a better washing machine, and you're going to get, hopefully, a better washing machine at the end of the day. And that's a perfectly valid outcome. If, on the other hand, you take a step back and you say, well, perhaps it's not about the washing machine, perhaps it's about exploring why it is that people feel the need to wear clean clothes, what, what do they like about that, why is that important to them, and how can they do it? All of a sudden, that opens up the door for lots of other potential solutions, so self-cleaning fabrics, alternative ways of cleaning or freshening your clothes, perhaps laundry as a service, so rather than washing it yourself, you use an app to... Um, get fresh clothes delivered to you, um, or perhaps you could rent clothes or have disposable clothing. There are all sorts of disruptive solutions that you could explore just by reframing the problem. It's also worth recognising that design as a process tends to be comfortable with, in, with uncertainty, at least at the beginning of the process. When you start out on this journey, Necessarily, if it's a design project, we don't want you to come to that with preconceived ideas of what the solution should look like, or indeed, necessarily have a full understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. All that is going to come out in the wash, if you like, during the design process, and that's fine. Um, but it can be quite an emotional process. When you start this journey, there is uncertainty there, and it can, at stages, feel a bit um, unclear as to where the project is leading you and what your outcomes are, are going to be. That's fine. The key is to 
plan a, a sound design process based, for example, on the double diamond process and follow that rigorously and trust in that process to deliver a good outcome at the end of the day. Design is also very effective at bridging communication barriers, not only between businesses and their markets, uh, uh, customers and users, but also internally between different uh, teams within the organisation who often speak different languages and have different perspectives, and also between collaborative partners on a project. Design does that by using visual material and physical practical prototypes, and that's a very good way of sharing ideas and ensuring that everyone understands the motivation and thinking behind an idea uh, and it allows them to contribute and feel that they uh, are part of the process. Another point is that the design process encourages fast learning and iteration through regular testing and, and prototyping of experiences. And if you haven't already seen it, I would encourage you to look at this uh, TED talk by Tom Chi of, uh, of Google. Um, and it's a presentation that he gives about the process that they used to prototype um, the Google Glass product um, at the early stages of their innovation journey. And what's interesting is how quickly they managed to do that. Now, Google Glass is quite a high-tech product, and you might think that it would take weeks uh, or even months to build the first prototype of such a, a high-tech piece of equipment. But in fact, they managed to do it in a matter of hours, just using materials that they had lying around or were able to buy um, via Amazon. So the first prototype used some coat hanger wire, uh, OHP sheets, a Pico projector that they'd bought online and, and someone's netbook. And it was sufficient to give them uh, a feeling of what it was like to experience um, a, a floating user interface in your, in your field of view. Obviously, it wasn't, uh, didn't prove the technology, but it was very useful learning in terms of the quality of the experience and how it felt, what they should be aiming for with their final solution. So that gives you, hopefully, a sense of uh, what we're looking for in this design competition and whether it might be relevant to you what kind of uh, activities and outputs we would expect to see within the funded projects. I'll talk a little bit now about the details of the competition itself. So a recap of the scope. We're looking for early stage projects that use human-centered design principles to generate ideas for immersive audience experiences across the creative industries. And we'll talk a bit in a moment about the definition of the creative industries. They might also be uh, um, generating ideas for tools, products, or services used to create and deliver immersive content. So it might be about the experience, or it might be about the tools used to create and deliver that experience. We expect to see fast, low-cost prototyping and user testing of those ideas. And projects should deliver clearly communicated, user-validated user ideas that are ready for further technical R&D activity. So I talked about the creative industries there and it's essential that your project aligns with one or more of the creative industries as set out in the DCMS definitions. So there are nine uh, sectors listed. They're uh, on the screen here. They are advertising and marketing, architecture, crafts, design, which could include product, graphic or fashion design, film, TV, video, radio and photography. IT software and services, including computer games, publishing, museums, galleries and libraries, and music, performing and visual arts. So it's essential that uh, your project aligns with one or more of those themes. Within those themes, the project could focus on the nature of the immersive experiences themselves. It could focus on the tools, processes or services used to create and distribute immersive content. Or it could look at the hardware and or software that's used to deliver those immersive experiences, or indeed any combination of those three areas. Equally, we're not looking here only for product design or graphic design or UX design solutions. Um, your project could look at, look, look at solutions including new products, services, experiences or even business models. It's worth pointing out uh, the, the hard limits, if you like. So projects that we won't, uh, won't fund through this competition 
uh, include those that focus on solutions in areas other than the creative industries. So again, referring to the list of nine sectors. We don't want to support projects that are late stage design development, i.e. the progression of an existing well-defined idea towards a final specification. If you're at that stage where you have confidence in an idea and you're just looking to develop it further towards commercialization, then the R&D funding is a better fit for you. Finally, we're not looking to fund projects that are primarily technical in nature and not directly concerned with understanding human experiences the human-centred element of these design projects um, and the quality of the customer uh, and audience experience is critical. A point on timescales. So the competition opens on the 21st of May. It closes on the 4th of July 2018. If you've applied, you'll receive notification of, of whether you've been successful by the 17th of August. And from that point on, we expect projects to be able to start from around about the 1st of October and those projects must last between two to six months and therefore end by the 31st of March 2019. An important point to note is that there will be further opportunities to apply for later stage R&D funding to further develop the ideas that you've initiated within your design projects. So applying for Design Foundations competition doesn't mean that you're going to miss the boat on any R&D funding opportunities. If you generate and validate great ideas as part of your design process, there will be some money made available at a, a later point in 2019 to develop those ideas further. Some notes about the funding. So the funding is available for projects with total costs between 20 and 60,000 pounds. That is the total project cost. So that's the combination of the grant value, which is a, a percentage of the total cost, and the applicant's contribution. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. The rates of funding are as follows. So if you're a small or micro business, you can win 70% of your total eligible project costs. If you're a medium-sized business, 60%, and for large businesses, 50%. To lead a project, you must be a UK registered business. You must carry out your project work in the UK, and you must intend to exploit the results of that project in or from the UK. You can work alone or in collaboration with others, be they businesses, the research base or the third sector. But a note that only small to medium enterprises can work alone on projects. If you're not an SME, uh, then it needs to be a collaborative project. If it is a collaborative project, then you must include at least one SME as part of your project team. Any one business can lead on one application and partner in a further two applications. If a business is not leading on an application, it can be a collaborator in any number of applications. And those collaborative uh, project partners can include businesses, universities, non-profit research and technology organisations, including catapult centres, independent research organisations or cultural institutions. Again, important to note that non-business partners cannot lead on the application, but they can collaborate on any number of project applications. In terms of funding for research organisations, universities are eligible for 100% funding at 80% of the full economic costs, and other research organisations can claim 100% of their project costs, but they must be non-profit distributing and disseminate the project results. Public sector organisations or charities, again eligible for 100% of their costs, but they must be performing research activity and disseminate, disseminate the project results, and they must ensure that the eligible costs do not include work or costs already funded through other public sector bodies. Finally, on, uh, on funding for research organisations, all of those research organisations within a project combined cannot claim more than 30% of the total eligible project costs. So this is in any capacity, whether they are contributing as collaborators or subcontractors. And if your consortium contains more than one research organisation, this maximum will be shared between them. A quick point on the application form. Um, it's slightly shorter than usual, which is the good news. If you're applying in for R&D funding through Innovate UK, you may be familiar with our uh, routine regular application form, which has 10 questions. For the Design Foundations competition, that's reduced to six scored questions. And they are as follows. 
So the first question asks about your project motivation and objectives. Essentially, why are you doing the, the project? What do you believe the opportunity is? Why is it of value? And then a bit more specifically about the project activities and outputs. So you can think of that really as your project plan. What do you expect to do when? And what do you expect to be the outputs of those different activities? Um, alongside your answer to that question, you can submit a PDF appendix, uh, maximum of uh, two pages, and one megabyte in size, uh, to support your answer. So that might include a Gantt chart, for example, or some more details on your uh, activities and outputs. The third question asks about your project team and any resources that you will need or uh, need to factor into the project. Again, you can include a PDF appendix to support your answer to that question. We're particularly interested to understand the design capability within your team. So if this kind of early stage human design activity uh, is new to your organization, it's going to be important that you bring in the capability, the resource to deliver that activity to a high standard. So in, the, in your answer to this question, you can talk about the design expertise that you're accessing and any relevant experience or expertise that they're bringing to the table. You might want to include short uh, team member biographies, for example, in your appendix. The fourth question asks about risks. So what are the risks to the involved inherent in this project and how do you expect to mitigate those risks? In your answer to this question, it's worth considering how you uh, expect to overcome any barriers that might exist to this creative design process within your organization and how you can uh, make sure that ideas coming through this design activity have maximum traction. So are you ensuring that all of the internal stakeholders are fully on board and engaged with this project? Are you communicating effectively to them? Are you working collaboratively as a team and so on? The fifth question asks about additionality. Essentially, why do you need public funding to do this project? Is it something that you could fund uh, in other ways? Um, is it the case that you need the money uh, to make the project happen full stop? Or is it the case that public funding will um, help the project to happen quicker than it would otherwise or with better outcomes than it would otherwise? And finally, a question about costs and value for money. So explaining, obviously, the overall costs of the project and why you believe the project represents value for money for the UK taxpayer. So that uh, hopefully gives you a useful overview of the project, uh, the competition itself. All that remains is to wish you best of luck with your applications. And if you do have any uh, questions, all the documentation can be found online, including uh, the brief and scope documents. And also, I uh, suggest that you look at our general guidance for applicants, which goes into a lot of detail about um, collaborative uh, funding levels and so on. If you can't find the answer that you need there, pick up the phone to our customer services uh, team. They're very helpful. Uh, they're available 9 to 5.30, Monday to Friday, uh, or connect with them via email at the address shown. Thank you. Yeah, my name's Alexis, and my colleague Helen will be coming up uh, a bit later to talk you through the finance questions that we're going to be asking you in the application. So this is just an overview of what we're going to be telling you about. So it's actually the really vital part of how you apply, what we're going to ask you, and how you're going to be assessed. I wanted to review the eligibility criteria again. So the lead must be a UK-based business. You must be intending to carry out your project work in the UK and intending to exploit the results in or from the UK. If you're working alone, you have to be a UK-based SME. And if you are part of a collaboration, that collaboration must have an SME in it. So as uh, Tom said, the project costs are between 20,000 and 60,000. And the project length between two months and six months. Uh, we're expecting projects to be able to start from the 1st of October 2018 and be ending by the 31st of March 2019. 
So if you are unsure whether you meet these eligibility criteria, please just contact the customer support team. Um, they're really easy to get in touch with. You can email them, you can phone them, and Helen will share their details later. Types of organizations, um, Tom went through this a bit earlier. So a UK business, small, micro, medium, or large, we use EU definitions for those. Uh, research organizations, so that includes universities, um, RTOs, the public sector research establishments, research councils, uh, independent research organizations. And you could also have public sector organizations or charities doing research activities as part of your consortium. Again, a review of those participation rules. So it does come from the state aid scheme, <laughs> which aims to optimize the level of funding to business and recognize the importance of research base for projects. So at least 70% of your total eligible project costs must be incurred by business. So Helen will go through in a bit more detail eligible and ineligible project costs. And where you can find more information on that is the Innovate UK website. And the maximum level, that 30% remaining, is to be shared by all of the research organizations. So if you have more than one, as Tom said, you're going to be cutting that 30% and sharing it between all of those research organizations. So what is collaboration? So if you are looking to collaborate on this, we mean that at least two organizations are claiming a grant. We're also looking for a business-led consortium, so it could involve both businesses and research organizations, though, and evidence of effective collaboration. So why are you actually collaborating? Why do you need these other partners in your consortium? And your project, it can include contributing partners that don't receive any funding. So for example, you could have non-UK businesses but their costs will count towards your total project costs, but they won't count as a collaborator. And uh, Tom already got a question on this, um, but if you're an SME, if you're an SME, you can work alone. Any one business may lead on one application and partner in a further two applications. If you're a business who's not leading on any applications, you can be a collaborator in any number of applications. And so non-business partners, um, they can't lead, so they can collaborate on any number of applications. Uh, just a word on resubmission. So you will be asked the question whether your application is a resubmission. So if you've applied for the same project to a previous Innovate UK competition, if it was deemed out of scope for the other competition, that is classed as a resubmission. If it was deemed as ineligible, so for example, if you um, put in a funding request over the limit for that competition and you got a return that said, you, actually, you're ineligible, that doesn't count as a resubmission. It's just if you are out of scope so, key dates, a reminder, the competition opens today. So, you might have seen it on the website already, but you've just not been able to apply until today. Submission deadline is noon on the 6th of July. So, we're using uh, an online system. Some of you may be familiar with it, Innovation Funding Service. You said 6th of July. Oh, sorry. I meant the 4th of July. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you, um, if you press submit any time after noon, the system will not actually allow you to submit. So please make sure that you're, the most that you're doing on that 4th of July is reviewing that you've completed all the sections and that you can actually press that submit button. 
as Helen will show you, uh, we know that people leave it till the last moment. We know that people then try and call the customer support line and they're very busy. You might not get through or they might not have the time to help um, if you leave it far too late. And as Tom said, applicants will be informed on the 17th of August. So the actual process, if you have been on the Innovate UK website, there is a link that says latest funding opportunities and that will take you to the innovation funding service. So you can use keywords to search. If you're searching for audience or audience of the future, obviously there are the two streams. There's the design foundations and the demonstrator. So please make sure they are very different competitions. Please make sure you're clicking that start new application on the correct stream of the competition. So when you do click on that start new application, if you've applied through the innovation funding service before, it will just ask you to sign in um, or it will ask you to create an account and you can use company's house search to enter your business details. When you've uh, finished that, uh, you've submitted <laughs> you've submitted to say that you want to start that application. You're taken to an application overview page. So what I've highlighted there is view team members and add collaborators. So if you're the lead, you'll be able to invite people. And also view the grant terms and conditions. So Helen will show you a bit later, but when you're actually um, throughout the, the project finances section, you're asked to agree to those grant terms and conditions before you submit the application. So it is important that you actually take the time to have a look at them. So if you do want to invite any collaborators, uh, you simply enter their name and their email address and the system itself will send them an email and invite them to log in or sign up. On that overview page, if you scroll down, you have that application progress bar, you have project details, application questions, and further down is your finances section. And when you're answering a question, we've tried to make it as easy as possible. So you can assign the question to someone else. Uh, you need to have invited them first. Uh, we have the blue drop down, what should I include in this particular section? So that gives you more details of what the assessors will be looking for. You can do some level of formatting, so bold, italic, a numbered lists, bullet pointed lists. You can't include graphics in your answer section. It won't accept it. Um, it tells you the word count remaining. It saves it as you're going along. Um, and that... In the bottom left, it says mark as complete. So before you submit, you need to make sure that each of those questions is marked complete. You can do that at any time. And if you do mark it complete, you can go back to that question and edit it up until you press that submit button. So in the project details section, so the lead gets asked what the title is your estimated start date and duration, the research category. So for this um, competition, the research category is feasibility studies. You can find the actual definition of what we mean by feasibility studies on the Innovate UK website. And you'll be asked again if your application is a resubmission. The project summary. So that's asking you about the need, the technological challenge, uh, or the kind of opportunity that you're going to be addressing. What's your approach that you're going to take? And if you're, the differences that you're hoping this project will make to your competitiveness and productivity. So obviously for the design projects, sorry, that's a bit out of the slide. Uh, so for the design projects, it's okay if you don't know yet the exact nature of your need and your innovation. So talk about the project context, talk about the motivations and the objectives of your project. So the public description, <laughs> so to comply with a government practice of openness and transparency on public funded activities, Innovate UK has to publish 
information related to funded projects. So please think about what you're going to write here. It is a public description, so try and make it understandable to the project. Avoid using jargon if you can, and think about if there are any confidentiality issues that you might not want to include in your public description. So the scope. So a scope check, after you've submitted, a scope check takes place, and we can use this information to ascertain whether you are in scope or not and whether your application should be sent to the assessors. The assessors also get to see what you've written in this scope section. So they don't mark it, they don't give it a score, but it really helps them um, give them an idea of what you're trying to achieve in your project. <laughs> Again, if you're unsure about whether your application is in scope, please contact us to discuss that well in advance. So on to the actual application questions. As Tom said, there's six questions. So if you are applying for both competitions, they are different questions. Question one is asking you about uh, the context and motivations of your project, uh, key aims and objectives, who might benefit from them, and any relevant wider economic, social, environmental, cultural, or polit political challenges uh, which you may be aware of. Question two, so the assessors are looking to see that you've uh, thought through your project, um, obviously relevant to it being a feasibility study. Um, so you can submit an appendix here. The system allows for PDF appendices only, and they need to be a maximum of one megabyte. So, for example, if you've applied to us before the 10 questions, you might submit a work breakdown structure here. Obviously, for a feasibility study, you might not have a very detailed work breakdown structure, but something that's visual for the assessors, um, basically explaining what you're going to do, who's going to do it, and what you think your outputs are going to be. Your team and resources. So again, the assessors are looking to see if you've actually identified the team that you'll need and access to resources and facilities. Uh, if you do have any key external parties, so subcontractors, um, are the subcontractors UK-based? And if they're not, can you justify why you're using a non-UK-based subcontractor? Um, there might be some gaps in your team because this is a feasibility study. You've just started thinking about it potentially. So highlight any of those gaps. And you also allowed an appendices for this question, uh, which should allow you to describe the skills and experience of the main people who are going to be working on the project. Please make sure that the font is legible at 100% zoom on any appendices that you upload. Um, if it's blurry or if the assessors uh, can't read it for any reason, they're obviously not going to have that to be able to assess your application fully. So question four is asking about risks. So this question doesn't have an appendices. If you're familiar with applying when we have the normal 10 questions, we uh, expect you to upload a risk matrix. Obviously, this is a feasibility study. It's really early design foundations, but the assessors are still wanting to see that you've appreciated, you've thought about the risks. So not just technical risks, uh, commercial, managerial, any environmental risks. So with this level of project, there should be a lot of uncertainty and uncertainty means risks. So can you articulate what you've identified already and what any mitigations you might have in place for those risks are? Question five, so it's called additionality. And what we're actually asking you uh, is what difference this public funding would make to your project. So also tell us why you've not been able to wholly fund the project from your own resources and 
what would happen if your application was unsuccessful? Would you still be able to carry out the work? Uh, would it potentially be delayed or descoped? Or would you have to abandon it? And question six asks you about costs and value for money. Um, so asking about how the partners will actually finance their contributions to the projects. And the assessors are looking to see that your project's reasonable costs and good value for money. So how does it compare with what you would spend your money on otherwise? Have you been able to justify the balance of costs and grant across the project partners? And have you justified any subcontract costs and why they're critical to your project? So Helen's going to talk to you about the application finances part. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. So apologies to those of you who were here this morning because um, my section is essentially exactly the same um, because we use the same um, funding rules across all of our competitions. Um, so please bear with me if you've already heard me say this once today. Um, so the amount of funding that you can receive depends on the type of organization that you are. Um, funding is awarded to each partner organization within your project. Um, so there's no overall grant limit. Um, it's about what each individual organization can claim. Um, and that's based on what type of organization they are. So for businesses, um, we have small and micro, medium and large. Um, and you can claim um, a certain proportion of your eligible costs, depending on which one of those you fit into. Um, and you have to match fund the rest of that amount. Um, and that match funding can come from, um, from anywhere. So it could be your um, own cash. It could be from an investor. Um, it's important to note that it can't be any other type of public funding. Um, if you are receiving any other public funding towards this project, then that would come off the amount of grant that you can claim. Um, research organizations, so we have universities um, who would need to apply through the JES system. They can claim... Um, it's 100%, but it's actually 80%. Um, so it's 80% of their full economic costs. So when they apply through the JES system, that will calculate their full economic cost, and it will calculate 80% of that. And that's the amount that we would expect to see um, of their project cost, which goes into the project itself. So that remaining 20% shouldn't appear anywhere in your project costs. hope that makes sense. I'm sure if there's any academics in the audience, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, other research organizations can claim 100% of their costs. Um, if you are a research organization um, or from a university, you must explain in the project how you plan to disseminate the work that you've done on the project and how you, so how you'll be sharing that. Um, and then we have public sector organizations or charities. Again, they can claim 100% of their costs, um, but again, they have to explain how they plan to disseminate the work that they've done. And also for any public sector organizations, make sure that you're not claiming for anything which is already being paid for out of public money as that wouldn't be eligible. Um, and as we've said, 30% um, of your total project costs can be incurred by research organizations. That also includes public sector organizations and charities. So essentially any partners who are claiming that 100% fall within that 30% of your overall total project costs. Um, so each organization will need to go in and complete their finances. Um, so it's up to each individual partner to go in and put in their eligible costs. So the first section that you'll need to complete is your project costs. Um, now this is, so this is for every type of organization apart from universities who would apply through the JES system. Um, and I'll explain what universities need to do in a moment. So in terms of the project costs that you can apply for, there's um, these seven different categories. Now, there, are, there is some detailed guidance um, on the website, um, and it's also linked to from within um, the IFS system. Um, if you haven't applied to us before or you're not sure what costs you should be putting in here, please do have a read of that guidance. Um, it does tell you in a bit more detail exactly what you can and can't claim for within each of these categories. So for labor costs, you can claim for the time of any staff who are working directly on the project. Um, they will need to be paid through PAYE, and you can include national insurance, pension, and non-discretionary costs. You can't claim for dividends, bonuses, or any time when they're not working on the project. Um, so you need to tell us um, what their role is within the project, um, the salary, how many days they'll be working on the project, and that will then calculate your labor costs. 
Um, now, there are some other rules for small and micro companies who don't operate a payroll. Again, there's more detail about that um, online, about how you can pay yourself a salary. Um, so it's £22 an hour for 40 hours a week, I think, which is in line with European Commission rules. Um, and you need to be able to audit that through timesheets. Um, but if that does apply to you, there is more detail within the project cost guidance about how you can claim for that time if you don't have a PEA scheme in your organisation. In terms of overheads, um, so there's various different ways you can calculate your overheads. So obviously there's no overheads if you don't have any. You can select 20% of your overhead costs. Um, now that's probably the quickest and most straightforward way of calculating your overhead. So that's 20% of labor costs. Um, or you can click calculate overheads if you want to go in and itemize exactly what your overheads are and calculate that. Now this um, would be scrutinized in more detail by our project finance team to make sure all of those costs are um, eligible and are valid. Um, so if you are calculating your own overheads, there's two different types of overheads. And again, there's a lot of guidance about this online. Um, so we have indirect overheads. These relate to the administration functions that support the project. Um, so this is, for example, HR, finance, um, any admin roles where they're not working directly on the project itself, but they are there in a support role. And you can claim for their time that they'll be spent working supporting the project and also any overheads relating to those members of staff such as um, office equipment etc and you must be able to demonstrate that the time they're spending on the project that is over and above what they would be doing as business as usual and these overheads are being incurred in addition to what you would be paying otherwise you also have direct overheads so these are the overheads related to the people who are working directly on the project um, so office utilities it equipment um, etc any any overheads related to those members of staff and you need to provide a detailed breakdown um, so that we can go through and check those you then have materials so if you need to purchase any materials that you'll be using directly on the project um, you need to list the item and the quantity um, tell us what the cost is and then that will work out your total materials costs then we have capital equipment so if you need to buy any equipment or you're using any equipment in which you currently own and you'll be using that over the project, um, either using it fully on the project or sharing it with your business as usual, you can claim for the depreciation of that item. So tell us what the item is, whether it's new or existing, um, the depreciation period, the value at the start and at the end of the project, and then you can claim for the difference. Then have subcontractors. So um, if you are planning to use subcontractors in your project, tell us who they are, the country where they'll be doing the work, and what their role will be in the project. Um, now, we, we ask you the country because, obviously, as Innovate UK, we want to be funding the UK supply chain wherever we can. Um, however, if you do need to go outside of the UK to access specific skills or resources that you can't access here, um, that's fine. Just make sure it's really clear why you need to go outside of the UK and justify that um, decision to us. Um, now, assessors don't see the detail in this part of your finances, so do remember anything around subcontractors and their role in the project, you need to explain in your application form as well. Um, and then we have travel and subsistence. So this is obviously any travel subsistence costs directly relating to the project. So for example, traveling to meetings to see your um, project partners would be eligible in this category. Um, so tell us um, what the item is, how many times you believe you're gonna incur that cost and what the cost is, and that will calculate your TNS. and um, And then finally, we have other costs. So obviously this is anything else where you're going to incur a cost on your project which doesn't fit into any of those other categories. So for example, that might include training, market assessment, um, licensing of new technologies, um, patent filing costs for new IP, um, SMEs can claim up to 7,500 for that. Um, and there's more detail as well online of the types of things we might expect to see in this category. But just make sure if you do include anything in here, it's not counted in any of the other categories as well. So once you've input your project costs for the work that your organization will be doing on the project, um, the next section is your organization. So we ask you um, what size of business you are, and that's used to calculate the amount of grant that you can receive. Um, and then there's some other financial information we'll ask you for, which is for Innovate UK to use if you are successful. Um, and then we have the your funding section. So um, it will tell you the maximum amount of grant that you can claim. 
um, and then you need to enter the amount of grant that you want to claim. Um, it may be that you want to adjust that down. Not many people do, but there may be a reason for why you want to claim less. Um, or, for example, if you're receiving public funding from elsewhere, then that would be lower. Um, you'll also, so you'll need to tell us if you are receiving any public funding towards this project from any other source. If you're receiving public funding for something that's come before this project or for some related work, don't put that in here um, because that would then come off the amount of grant that you can receive from us. So it's only if it's directly for this project. Um, and each partner organization will be asked to agree to the terms and conditions at this point as well. Um, now in the past, if you've applied to us um, in the last couple of years and you've been successful, you would have received a conditional offer letter um, after finding out that you're successful, um, usually around a month or so afterwards. With our online system, each organization accepts the terms and conditions before submitting the application, which means there's no longer a conditional offer letter. So it speeds things up further down the line if you are successful. If you have any partners in your um, collaboration who are not claiming grant, um, they still need to be invited as a partner to join the application. Um, they just need to select not requesting funding. They will need to go through and put in their project costs so we know the value of their contribution to the project. And that will count towards your total project costs, so do bear that in mind. Um, and they wouldn't be named in the grant offer letter if your project is successful. Um, and just to note, the lead must be claiming grant. So for academic partners, um, they will need to apply through the JES system, first of all. Um, so the JES system is owned and run by the research councils, um, and we follow all of their guidelines when it comes to funding academic partners. Um, so it is a completely separate system from the Innovation Funding Service. So academics will need to complete a JES form and have that um, approved, and then they will need to also put their details into IFS as well. So academic partners will see a screen that looks like this. So they'll, um, as the lead, you will need to invite any academic partners to be a collaborator in the same way that you would for um, any, any partner in your consortium. Um, so they'll go in and in project costs, they need to put in um, what they're claiming under each of these categories, which mirrors the JES form. So just copy the numbers over exactly as they are. Please just double check they do match or we have a problem further down the line when we're not offering you the correct amount of funding. Um, and make sure there's enough time um, for the JES form to be approved um, and have a with council status so that that can be uploaded um, along with your submission to Innovate UK before the deadline. Um, and as well as the financial information in the JES form, we also ask for justification of resources and pathways to impact to be included as well. And if you do have any questions on the JES form and the process and the system, please contact the JES help desk rather than the Innovate UK support team um, as they um, they run the system and they have full view of it, whereas we don't. So when it comes to submitting your application, um, you'll need to review it before you submit. <clears throat> so you need to go in and mark every question as complete once you're happy that it's complete. Um, if you do mark it as complete and then you want to go back and change it, that's fine. You can do it. It won't stop you from editing it again. Um, nothing is locked down until you press the final submit button. And at that point, you can't go back and make any changes. Um, but you do need to check that everything's marked as complete before you submit it. So don't leave it until 11.59 to go through and mark each question as complete. Because um, it's very frustrating when applicants phone us up and they've spent a long time on their application. And then they just haven't managed to hit all the buttons in time because they left it until the last few minutes. Unfortunately, if you miss a deadline, there's nothing we can do. Um, so you'll see a project cost summary. This is what each partner will see if it's a collaborative project. You can see the top level costs um, for each category for every partner, but you can't see the detail behind it. You'll only see the detail for your own section. So that is confidential to each partner. This is also what the assessors will see. Um, before you submit, it will remind you of the funding rules. Um, so do just make sure you are within the rules that we've stated in the brief. Uh, again, it's another frustration that we see um, in, where applicants have, again, spent a long time on a really good idea and putting their um, application together, but their costs are over what we've said we want the pr total project cost to be or the project's too long. Um, and unfortunately, that means they are ineligible and we can't send them out for assessment. Um, and obviously, it's very frustrating for you as an applicant if that happens when you've put all of that effort in. So make sure that you've really read the brief and that you are within the constraints that we say in the brief. If you're not clear on anything, how your project fits, get in touch with us before the deadline and we can help you with that. 
Um, IFS will check before you submit that your research costs are within that 30%. Um, so it doesn't check that your costs are within the limits of the competition. Um, that is for you to make sure, but it will check the, the research um, participation is okay and it won't let you submit if that's incorrect. Um, so when you're ready and everything's marked as complete and it's all looking good, um, you submit your application, it will say this is your final chance to make any changes and then you click yes you want to submit and after that point you can't make any changes we can't make any changes as well so if you realize you've made a mistake unfortunately if you phone us once you've submitted it we can't go in there and change things for you um, once you've submitted it um, you'll receive an email confirming that it's been submitted you'll see what happens next um, and you can go back in at any time to view your application or print it out um, now, this slide is just to illustrate what we've, I think we've all stressed about the midday deadline. So this is from our recent emerging and enabling um, competition. This shows um, by hour the number of applications that were submitted up to the deadline. So you can see that most, the vast majority of people are submitting within the last two hours. Um, obviously, our support team get really busy around then. They do their very best to help everybody that calls up. Um, but we do tend to get a lot of calls leading up to the deadline, or we get people who've um, you know, made a mistake and are trying to correct it in a hurry, or they submit something that's only half finished. Um, so do just give yourself plenty of time just to give yourself the best chance possible. Double check everything, make sure that you're happy with it all before you submit. Um, and we can help you with any, any issues that you might have or any questions you might have. Um, the sooner you call us, the more we can help. Um, you'll have a dashboard, so when you go back into IFS, you'll be able to see where your project is. So whether it's in um, out for assessment or if you're successful, that's where you'll go to set up your project. Um, so in terms of assessment, once you've submitted your application, that will be reviewed by five assessors. Um, so they are um, a selection of people from um, a range of backgrounds who have expertise in this area. So they'll be from industry and academic backgrounds. Um, and the innovation team will be looking at your application to decide which, which assessors have the most relevant expertise to review your application. In terms of what they're looking for, they're looking for clear and concise um, answers which answer the questions in the guidance. Um, so do make sure you read the guidance really carefully. Make sure that you are addressing the various things that we're asking you to address so that they can award you um, the most points possible. So the right amount of information, so don't put in loads of detail that might be really interesting, but if it's not relevant to the question, you're not going to get any marks for it. So make sure that the information you include is really relevant, really concise. Equally, don't leave any gaps in there so that the assessors are having to make assumptions about your application or sort of try and guess what it is that you might be doing. Make sure that any claims you put in there are quantified and justified and show the assessors that you've got a really good idea. Um, it's a good, a good opportunity for growth. It's really innovative, but it needs some public money to really help your idea get going. And you've got a great team in place and a really good approach to running a project that means it's got a really good chance of being successful. Um, so really with your application, you want to make it really interesting for the assessors, make sure it reads well, make sure it's appealing to them. If they're looking at a lot of applications, you want to make sure that yours really stands out. You will receive feedback from the assessors. Um, that will be available for you to view in IFS once you've been notified whether you're successful or not. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful for you whether you are successful or not. Um, if you're unsuccessful, hopefully it can help you if you apply into a future competition to know where you can improve next time. Um, a few slides finally about what happens if you are successful um, and setting up your project. So you'll go through project setup in IFS. Um, and there's various steps to complete in there. Um, so the lead will need to provide us with um, your collaboration agreement if it's a collaborative project and an exploitation plan. Each partner will need to go in and put their finance contact details in there and provide us with their bank details so that we can pay you. Um, and we'll be doing our own checks on your project costs at the same time to make sure that your um, costs that you're claiming for are eligible um, and that they meet any state aid rules. And also checking that um, if you're a business that you've Got, you can match fund the grant and um, that you are a legitimate um, registered business. We aim for all projects for you to provide us with all of those details within 30 days um, and projects must start within 90 days. Um, please note that project change requests can't be submitted before the project starts so make sure when you put your application in that is the project you are intending to to run with, um, because if you want to start changing partners around or things before you started, unfortunately, um, we, we can't accommodate that. 
Um, another thing that is worth noting, which is a rule that we've recently introduced, if you have an existing project with Innovate UK and you haven't submitted your final claim, um, along with the independent accountants report, if that's outstanding, you won't be eligible to receive grant in future competitions until that's resolved. So if that does apply to you or any of your partners, that needs to be resolved um, in order for you to apply into a competition and receive funding. Um, if you are working in a collaboration, start thinking about your collaboration agreement early on in the process, as this is something that can hold projects up from starting. Um, so make sure you um, talk about that with your partners and get that in place and ready to go for if you're successful. Um, we don't need to be involved in that, but we need to see that you've got one and that it's been signed by everybody. Um, if you are successful, your grants will be claimable quarterly in arrears. Obviously, these are quite short projects, um, so just be aware of the cash flow for that first quarter. Um, you can only claim for costs that have been incurred and paid between the project start and end dates. So don't start your project before the agreed start date um, or you won't be able to claim for those costs. Um, you'll be assigned a monitoring officer, so they will, um, they'll be your main point of contact with Innovate UK and they will monitor your project um, to check it against the financial forecast that you've provided us with and your project plan that you've provided us with. Um, and they'll be there to help you along the way with any queries that you have. Um, with your project. If you need to get in touch with us, these are um, the customer support services contact details. They're a very helpful, knowledgeable bunch. So if you've got any queries as you're putting your application together, do get in touch with them. Um, and if they can't help you, then they'll pass the question on to um, either my team or to the, to the innovation team to be able to advise you on that. Um, and they do, they, I think they need to get back to you within a couple of days. So they're, they're generally pretty quick at coming back to you if you email them. And obviously if you call them, then they will be able to help you with your query.